When you're camping in Africa, you never know exactly what you're going to find. You're going to find animals of every type interacting in ways that you can't imagine with immense beauty and tenderness and tremendous uh, playfulness as well as cruelty. The cruelty of dog eat dog, hyena eating animals, cheetah eating animals, crocodiles and predators having to survive the giant hippopotamus that kills you without even thinking twice about it if you're in his way, the violent mating of lions, the playfulness of cubs as they're learning to fight and eventually one day kill, the beautiful serenity of the tall giraffes, the cheetahs as they become playful with you as they get to know you, and the giant elephants who seem to fear nothing, and the vast seas filled with pirates and filled with enormous fish of tremendous strength. Hi, I'm Sherman Silver. My son is Steve Silver. And we decided to go camping outdoors to have an adventure in Africa in March of 2013. And what we found about nature, which we've been exploring for all of our lives, is that there is immense beauty, incredible vistas and biology to behold, but there also is immense cruelty and toughness out there. We learned about both on this trip, and I'd like to share a little bit of that with you, as well as the great father-son bonding pulled us together as we uh, began to really share this little spectacular corner of the universe East Africa, which I like to call um, Eden, or uh, the birthplace of humanity. So here we are arriving at what you might call Indutu Airport, which is a tiny airstrip. And we go into our tents and check out our tents, and we listen uh, beautifully as we watch our campsite uh, to the ringneck doves as they serenade us, just like out of Africa. They're everywhere. They're the music of Africa. Wherever you go, the ringneck doves are supplying us with the reminder that we are in Africa at the beginning of life and the beginning of mankind. The camp is a pleasant place, but surrounded by it is an absolutely incredible wilderness with literally no exaggeration Millions and millions of wildebeest that are uh, raising their calves that were just born last month, and zebras who are raising their calves that were born very recently. And you see them all huddled together in a absolutely serene environment where it seems like it's the Garden of Eden and there can be no threat whatsoever. The babies uh, nurse from their mothers, the uh, placenta barely out and the young babies nursing from the youngest age they stand up as soon as they're born because if they can't stand up as soon as they're born then this dangerous part of Africa where the herd is in repose suddenly becomes a place of death you must keep up with the herd you must be able to start walking within three minutes of being born as a wildebeest or you will die you will be left behind, the hyenas and the lions and the cheetahs will get you. Now this little baby was born less than a minute ago. You can see the placenta hanging out of the mother. You can see the umbilical cord hanging out of this little baby. And he's got to learn how to walk within three minutes. Whoops, there he goes, falling down. He gets up and tries again, and somehow or other, through millions of years of evolution, he has learned that if he can't really walk, and indeed run, within three minutes, he won't survive, because he can't keep up with the herd. He cannot keep up with the herd that's protecting him from the hyenas and the lions and the leopards and the cheetahs that are ever lurking and waiting for a baby that's removed from its mother. 
that would be susceptible then to attack, just like by these lurking hyenas, just waiting for the opportunity to latch on to a little baby wildebeest that doesn't learn how to walk immediately. Here, in fact, is an example of a baby wildebeest alone, and we didn't understand why until we discovered a little bit of a mile away, hyenas had killed and were eating his mother alive. These hyenas felt that they were a big enough pack that they could actually attack the mother first rather than going for the baby. And they attack the mother, and they don't just kill the mother, they eat her alive. And after the mother is completely eaten, then they'll go after the baby. And after this ugliness, we then see the tall, elegant giraffes give us this renewed sense of serenity. Because this wilderness is filled with such intense beauty, along with the immense danger of having to survive, we see the stately elegance of these giraffes that can't sit down, incidentally. If they sit down they or lie down, they won't be able to get up again and they'll die because they will never be able to get up again. So they must drink this water by bending over with their tall necks and they have to sleep standing up and they literally do not dare lie down. Now this Cory Bustard is really trying to win his lady. I mean, he is puffing up his neck and his wings and he is moving forward. He is working on trying to get a mate. While the famous pink flamingos of Lake Indudu just casually with their beautiful mirror images eat the shrimp below which give them their beautiful incredible pink color. This is maybe the most famous scene of birds in all of Africa on Lake Indutu. And you can see them just digging for the shrimp and as they eat their shrimp they gradually turn into this amazing pink color. Marabou store coming in for a landing uh, you'd think would be bringing a little ba bundle of a baby because the storks are supposed to bring babies but not marabou storks. The marabou stork would just as soon eat your baby as bring your baby to you. But this beautiful bird once again renews our confidence in the beauty of birds because birds can be mean and ugly and dangerous like this African eagle resting on the tree that is so beautifully camouflaged. When we see them posed like this, it just is a sense of beauty and repose that is quite opposite to their rather vicious way of surviving. Here's a golden jackal that must have gotten into a tussle and lost one of his ears. Beautiful animal, except he's one-eared. And there's his buddy, and they hang around together. And th these are the most beautiful jackals, or fox-like creatures, I've ever seen uh, anywhere. They're hunting around for small little animals. African foxes, of course, are foxes. They're, they're quite different from jackals. They almost look like Yoda from Star Wars. And they're a, a completely different animal from the jackal that they seem to superficially appear like. Now, the mothers and the cheetah cubs, they're scanning in all directions. They have to look very, very far away before they can find their prey. And they have to sneak up on the prey from very far away and very cleverly. And the reason is, although they are the fastest animal on Earth, and they can run 70 miles an hour, they can only do it for about 10 seconds. So, in fact, if they were to go more than 10 seconds, they would drop dead of a heart attack. So they have to be very clever and sneak up on their prey, be very clever, and recognize whether the prey is within striking distance so they can outrun that prey and catch it before its 10 magical seconds are up. Here they are, just a happy family, playing around. Not a care in the world. Just a happy cheetah family representing the naivety of young life. And now the mother is preparing them to look for food, but before they do, they become distracted by us and they climb up on our vehicle. And they're very, very curious about us. You can see that uh, they're, they're checking us out. They're opening up their teeth fairly widely. And I don't think it's because they're angry with us, but they're seeing a reflection 
of another cheetah in the camera we're holding in front of them. And they want to make sure they don't have any competition from other cheetahs. So they're staring at us very, very carefully until they begin to find out that we're really friendly. Francesco has this cheetah by the tail, which is interesting, and he jumps off. And then Stevie decides he's going to do the same thing. They're all over our vehicle. You'd think we should be terrified, but these cheetahs, we're like cheetah whisperers, and these cheetahs have learned to respect us and not to fear us and not to view us as food or not to view us as threats. These cheetahs are just intensely curious and want to play with us. And that's a good feeling, knowing that nature wants to play with us. Stevie dangles his GoPro camera in front of this cheetah and doesn't know what it is, sees a reflection of himself, and he tries to hit it, tries to bang it. Here he is trying to bang the camera, figuring out what it is, playing with it. And in fact, he's wondering so much what it is, he tries to swallow it, and there is the inside of the cheetah's mouth as he's trying to swallow our GoPro camera. Eventually, they get tired of our little GoPro camera. We get some beautiful close pictures, but they finally run away. And uh, they're playing with the strap they tore from our vehicle. And they're still enjoying hanging out in our vehicle. So Francesco tries to swat them away with his famous fly swatter. Doesn't seem to be swatting them away too successfully. They seem to be more interested in chewing it than running away from it. But that was our main uh, defense. Uh, we didn't have any guns or knives. We just... Uh, used to fly swatter in case we needed any protection. And the real truth of it is, <laughs> these animals came to love us. We were animal whisperers. We were able to understand them, and they understood us, and we were part of their natural surrounding, and we were part of the family. And that's the secret to getting so close to these animals. Now here's a different, there's a lone mother cheetah who represents a different aspect of life for the cheetah. And she needs to hunt for food. She's very, very, very hungry. She lives alone. She's not playing with cubs. And she is slowly stalking this Tommy gazelle. It's a family, usually. They look for the youngest one they can find. And she's stalking the gazelle very slowly because she has to calculate if she's in with distance for the run to catch it without dropping dead from running for too long. And she figured it out perfectly, and she was able to get this gazelle because of her superior speed. And the gazelle, by the way, is extraordinarily fast also. Gazelle runs about 50 miles an hour, and the cheetah runs about 70 miles an hour. Very fast animals. And she's carrying her kill now away into the tall grass so she can eat it without being detected by either lions or hyenas that would be very happy to steal her kill and to steal her food. And she doesn't have a great grip on this Tommy, so she's afraid to let go because it might still be alive and run away. And she's lost her energy. She won't be able to make a run like that for another day. She's capable of making one run like that once a day. So she cannot afford to lose that and try to go after it again. Now the elephants are justly and... Uh, obviously called the king of the jungle. They are the kings and the queens. They wander slowly through the jungle, eating the most ridiculous stuff you could ever imagine. They grow to be 16,000 pounds, eating these little acacia trees and leaves, uh, a diet that uh, would certainly not nourish any other animal I know of. And they grow to 12 and 16 and 18,000 pounds just eating this, this funny acacia food. And they, they, and they wander and wander and never stop moving, always looking for new trees to knock down, which they knock down with tremendous ease, and eat the uh, acacia bark and the acacia leaves on them. As they come towards you, it's almost menacing looking. I mean, it's terrifying. They, they could just push you over and step on you and kill you very easily. But again, we stand still. They don't view us as threats. They don't view us as uh, trying to impede upon their territory or their food. We're just standing there. 
and we're watching this cute little baby come in for a hug from mommy. She's not such a young baby anymore, but she still holds on to mommy, and the mother is the leader of the herd, and the bull elephants just hang around to inseminate when the time comes. Here's an unusual scene of elephants taking a bath, particularly the babies taking a bath in this mud hole, which is kind of hard to find. And uh, these are just the happiest little playful elephants, and one day they'll grow up to be big and huge and impressive and charismatic like these parents, huge parents with huge horns that are able to knock down whole trees without a thought or push over a Land Rover. This female ostrich is actually searching for a male. These animals are powerful. They run fast and they can claw you to death in an instant. They are not the tame little things that you might think they are. And they're going through mating rituals so that they can make more ostriches, which I understand don't taste quite as good as a Thanksgiving turkey, but this is what we'll be having on Thanksgiving anyway when we're here next November. Now, it is so rare to get this close a view to an eland. It's just impossible. We were very lucky we snuck that close. This is high telephoto, but the picture you saw before was really no telephoto, and we were just remarkably close to an animal that is so beautiful, but is known for its ability to always keep its distance from anything or anybody. Now these Cape Buffalo are marching right through our camp. They're the most dangerous uh, animals in all of Africa and they just march right through our camp. They rely on these birds to uh, take the ticks off of their skin because they attract huge numbers of ticks and they'd be miserable without these birds on them all the time. But if you take a look at these animals that almost look like water buffalo, these Cape Buffalo are the most menacing animals in East Africa and cause the most deaths. And all of you know about that if you've read Ernest Hemingway's famous the Short Happy Life of Francis McComber. And they continue marching right through our camp. A thrill you can't imagine. Now, within 100 yards of our tent are these mating lions. And they mate constantly for an entire week or longer every 15 minutes. Now, it's only about three seconds or five seconds before they ejaculate. So this is the ultimate of premature ejaculation. And they make these great sounds while they're doing it. And then after about five seconds, that's it. Uh, and they are excited. They've had their ejaculation. They, she lays around. She feels in ecstasy. There they go again. And you'll see how quick this is. The expression of undying love, incredible romance, and girls, that's it. If you were a lioness, boy, I mean, you might have a, a frequent sex, but it wouldn't be great. There they go again, and they uh, right behind the tree. are about to go at it again for a very brief moment. You can see our tent in the background about 100 feet away, and they were doing this all night and all day while we were camping out during this entire trip. Can you imagine? The lions picked the spot right next to our tent. You can see our tent there in the background to have sex over and over and over again. And look at the exercise he's in from just three seconds of intercourse. But now he did something wrong. He was too rough. He wasn't gentle. He was not suave. And look at the blow she gives him. Look at how she's terrorizing. She's half the size of this big male. And she is really ticked off. And she really scared him away. It took at least an hour before she was ready to have sex with him again. And he knew better. He knew not to be so rough as to bite into her so or, good to, sex. or to stick his penis in too hard or to cause her any pain. She was definitely having her say in this matter. But every 15 minutes for seven days or longer, they're having sex. 
Now, after this is all over, the big male is busy watching his pride, making sure no other big male comes in to have sex with any of these females. And we spend a little time away from the mating lions just to play with this little pride of lions. Uh, this is a female that comes very, very, very close to us. And she's just yawning, but it's terrifying looking. And then one young male comes right up to our car, which is more terrifying than a cheetah, and decides he wants to get in. But uh, we were able to talk him out of that, luckily. Well, the lion cubs are playing, and it's very, very cute, but they're playing for real. They're, they're learning how to kill. I mean, they're, they're learning how to fight. They're learning how to fight for dominance. Which male becomes the dominant male in the uh, pride of lions is important. So they play rough. They're enjoying it. It's just play. But this play will lead to real adult competitive behavior later in life. These bachelors are giving up on trying to take over a pride, and they're just, this guy's taking a big drink of water. If you look at the beautiful reflection of his huge face as he's lapping up the water, and they're just resting and relaxing, and right now these are lazy guys waiting till they get bigger, big enough to challenge the head of the pride, but right now they're not there yet. Now, this a zebra was killed by a lion, but after the lion's done, this provides a meal for vultures and marabou storks that is really disgusting. Uh, these animals will fly in and they will finish off whatever is left of that zebra so there isn't a single thing left. They fly in from all over. Uh, Nubian uh, vultures as well as marabou storks and they eat every last bit of flesh now, zebras and wildebeest come right through our camp. This is a whole herd of them, and you'll see they're coming. There's our tent, and they're just coming right through our camp, very, very, very close. Yeah, so we started out at, uh, at our camp, which is, um, which is, in fact, up in this part, this corner of, uh, of Lake Ndutu, in the northwestern corner, and we followed the boundary track out, um, pretty much uh, between the Serengeti and the Ngorongora, followed out to the end of these marshes, cut down into the marsh, came out and found uh, the uh, cheetah and mother with the three cubs. We also found the lion with the two lioness in this area, mm -hmm. sat with them and eventually left them and followed the boundary track pretty much all the way down to about uh, this point and then cut across to the southeast into what's called this Angusoro uh, plain north of a place called Cacesio. And we've been zooming in so I can see your faces and all your details. Having a good time? We're having a good time. Taking our first ride in the saloon here. Oh, whoa, you are a big mother. Not tell a photo yet, folks. Whoa, whoa, I can't believe I'm getting him on this little point and shoot. Coming back, I got him in my camera. And there's a crocodile just waiting on the shore, and he's not going to go in until he sees a prey. And when he gets a hold of something, he looks slow, but when he gets a hold of something, he is fast and he never lets go. More and more hippopotami, more than you could ever imagine. These big animals are herbivores, they don't intend to kill you but they kill more animals than any other animal in all of Africa. Here we have Sherman with a uh, catfish of sorts. 
A squeaker, I think it's called. It's a squeaking catfish. This is the most unkosher thing I could have ever caught in my life. <laughs> it's about as unkosher as a Jewish boy can get. But, uh, and it certainly is not an impressive uh, example of his species. And we, but... and we promise we're not, gonna, we're not gonna make him eat it. Oh, God, no. <laughs> no scales. <laughs> This is really what the Torah would call a fucked up fish. <laughs> but uh, <laughs> I caught a fish at least. I got the record. Huh? I got the record. Do you hear it? Steve actually is an amazing rock climber. And so while we took a break, he decided to climb up an impossible rock that was going 70 degrees in the wrong angle. And I don't know how he climbed this thing, but he figures out how to get his footholds and he's just kind of like a, a mountain goat or a, a leopard, really. And he can get right to the top of the most absurd cliff. Taking some final casts on the Rufiji rivers before saying goodbye to the Rufiji. It's a beautiful, beautiful spot. The hippos bid us farewell with their huge mouths, which could just crush you in a second if you were in their way. And we end another beautiful day on the Rufiji. Now we're really doing fishing. The Somali pirates are just north of us. And look at that rainbow 70 miles out to sea, 70 miles east of the African coast where we see this full, incredible double rainbow like I've never seen before in my life. And in the midst of this incredible rainbow, we catch these enormous fish that I've never dreamed of catching. Here's a great big Dorito. Here's a big Dorito that Stevie caught. Here I have a big sailfish on. Uh, I am not ex obviously as strong as Steve, and it took me a long time and it was very hard to pull in this sailfish. But with much coaching and a lot of effort, I finally brought in the sailfish, which I might say is much bigger than the one uh, Julius caught in Florida when he was a kid, and I'll brag about that. But then the big catch of the day here is Stevie. He's catching some big Dorito, and he finally latches on to a marlin. And we caught at least 40 fish that day. You'll see he caught this giant trevally. Wait till you see. There's another beautiful Dorito that he caught, and that's actually mahi-mahi when it's served in the restaurant. But look at this monster he caught, this giant trevally. This is probably the biggest fish I've ever seen caught. Uh, it's, it's just impossible to hold on to. It's way bigger than Steve. And we return this fish to the sea because this isn't one we eat, and it's a rare fish. There's a beautiful Dorito, and me taking a picture of Steve and the beautiful Dorito. And we come back for more and more. We fished all day. We caught a fish all the time. We were catching fish for 40 hours in a row, non Stop. They never stopped coming at us. It was absolutely incredible. And there's the marlin. Steve hooks the marlin. And it took him an hour and a half to bring this fish in. He had very light leader that shouldn't be used for a marlin. But look at how he keeps that marlin on. Absolutely spectacular. Unbelievable deep sea fishing. Off the coast of Africa, not far from the pirates really. So now that you've seen the raw nature that Steve and I saw, uh, the wilderness of East Africa with uh, lions mating and uh, cheetahs uh, hunting and killing and lions killing zebras and uh, vultures uh, eating the remains and beautiful rainbows and huge vistas and elephants and gigantic herds of millions of animals migrating and nursing their young. Uh, likewise, you saw some amazing fishing, and we were just thrilled by being able to actually tug on a line with such a wild beast, huge fish, deep in the ocean and pull it out of its own little universe so we could actually see this spectacular rainbow that we were seeing. And we were th thinking just how wonderful this was. 
that we could be part of this natural wildness of these incredibly strong fish. But then I thought, and I wrote about this, we have to be ever aware of the beauty of life and be happy with this beauty, but also beware that hyenas are lurking in the corner and there can even be hyenas inside us. Uh, we could turn very, very ugly unless we keep our eyes open and always insist on beauty over cruelty. That's what I think I learned from this uh, brief moment we had uh, in this very, very wild country. Thank you very much for listening, and we'll see you again next time.